talk and very physical physics, no. It's very simple, not you know, so more meat for the shark when it's simple. So um, when you are, uh, the first point is that when you are in a lab and you try to manage you know, your grants and your student, you always want to find a solution that actually, in science, you say chip with few components. And I would say for industry, I mean, it means cost effective. Something that works that is simple and doesn't cost much money, so it's very marketable. And so uh, this is kind of trivial. Everybody knows it, everybody says it. I emphasize because the dri what drives our talk is simplicity. The second part is, um, of course, uh, uh, the, the title is complicated, so it's not that simple. Sorry for that, but it's complicated to make a title simple. And I'm not native from the United States, so my English is not that perfect. So accept some complexity in the title and simplicity <laughs> in the talk, please. <laughs> so, um, so that said, can, can, uh, uh, and the other part is what is the talk about. And so we work, we are in electrical engineering, we work every day with silicon wafer, silicon technology. So we work with things that is all over around you in your phone, things that is on, a, uh, on your car, uh, on a satellite, uh, in your dry dishwasher, those components are called MEMS. And uh, today, there's not just, MEMS become more complicated, so we want to do something that is sim uh, simplify the life uh, for the uh, whole market, uh, only a little step that simplify the life for the market. And so we call it semiconductor industry silicon compatibility technology. Uh, next slide. Okay, I just want to present uh, the Ravi, the students, and myself. I uh, actually present my wife after 25 years. <laughs> okay, I think she can share the intellectual property. Actually, she's the inspirator. She's in humanities, and she always tells me I speak an alien language when I speak about science. So she helped me to, I try to explain her what I try, what I try to develop, and so if she understands, hopefully you will understand. She doesn't, so fine. Uh, but, you know, that's my wife and Ravi. So next slide. So what is the innovation? Okay, we have this talk, and uh, we are not reinventing, uh, the, we are not reinventing the wheel, we are not creating something that conceptually is completely new. Chemical, wetch, chemical etching in semiconductor industry has been used for many, many years, chemistry. So this is not new, we, uh, we try to use chemistry in a different way. If you see three bullet points, is low cost solution and high yield, I already talked about, simplicity, cost effective. The first, the first two bullet points is heterogeneous integration, I already mentioned in my presentation two slides ago, what is heterogeneous integration? Enabling, enabling technology, chemical etching, in a different way for several material that can be uh, tied with silicon, and so we can, we can create new devices as well as we used to do with silicon, so simple as a silicon. And the last part is important, is 2D, 3D integration. We are not just looking at planar solution, but looking at stacking solution. So the technology uh, revitalizes uh, um, some chemicals that are used in silicon industry, and actually they apply to other material for 2D, 3D capability. And actually we are not limited just to semiconductor, but we can use in oxide, semiconductor, and metals. And now I let to Ravi. Uh, I, uh, coming to the back, one sec, okay. Coming to the background, there are like various kind of technologies has been reported before for this kind of processing, but the, uh, the main part of them is like, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, they have used high concentration HF in order to release MEMS kind of devices and optical systems. The, uh, using the high concentration makes the process complexity as well as it also create a lot of uh, cracks in it. The thing is like they have used combination of uh, water phase as well as vapor phase in this technology. And coming to the uh, other technologies, they have used TMEH and xenon difluoride for the release of MEMS devices, but which are also like very complex to use in the current uh, systems. Uh, you, you can see that it has like, uh, xenon difluoride is like the, uh, oops, uh, xenon difluoride, xenon difluoride is the good, oops. 
xenon difluoride is the good technology in the current generation for the MEMS resonators, but it has like a lot of complexity. It requires high, high kind of pressure, high kind of concentration, and different temperatures have been used for the, these technologies, and which is like very higher cost to build this kind of setup. So we come up with a new, new kind of technology in this uh, explanation. Uh, coming to the applications, it can be, our technology can be used in various kind of applications starting from consumer electronics. In the consumer electronics, it can be used in various kind of smartphones, wearables, and gaming consoles. And also it can be used in automobiles for uh, tire pressure monitoring as well as airbag deployment, which is one of the key uh, technology nowadays everyone is using because without MEMS resonators, air, uh, airbag deployation is like very complicated. And in the, in the other industries also, it can be like very much used coming to the a Air Force and the defense. It can be used in the navigation systems, in the health systems, it can be used in drug delivery monitoring. And coming to the market, MAME, uh, initial phase, we are currently focusing on the MEMS part, but which is not limited only to the MEMS. It can be utilized for the other semiconductor uh, domains as well. Uh, in, in the MEMS, it has like almost market of 14.32 billion in 2022, which has an projection of like 75 billions in by 2032, which is like a very big amount. That is the main reason we are like mainly focusing on uh, MEMS part rather than focusing on each and every part of this technology. Currently, in the MEMS part, 60% is like shared by consumer electronics. Most of the industries like Intel and TSMC use these kind of technologies in a different phase. They use uh, uh, water phase kind of uh, technology, but which is like uh, creates a lot of residues as well as a lot of complexity in the fabrication steps. Coming to our data, uh, initially we, we will be showing, uh, the, the left side picture shows the higher concentration release using vapor phase. Most of the technologies has reported not, uh, not less than 49% doesn't work for this technology for releasing MEMS resonator in HF. So uh, we have tested initially their results. It is like after re releasing certain area, it almostly cracks, after, almost cracks. In our technology, we have reported that uh, after with low concentration HF, which is like very controlled, the area, the amount of region we need to, uh, we want to release, which can be controlled using our process, which is with very less concentration. This is the MEMS resonators that we have released using this technology. You can clearly see uh, the good release region here, as well as here is the SEM image showing that it has been released clearly. You can see the air gap in between the MEMS resonator. If this device has been collapsed, there is like zero performance. If this happens in air airbag deployation system, then there will be no airbag deploying in the cars and the commercial market. So the making it air suspended is like very key factor for this technology. And our technology is not only limited to making it, uh, not only making it release with the sacrificial layer, our technologies can also be used in etching other materials like 3 and materials as well as silicon. Forgot I'm back. Uh, so uh, as you realize, the simple example it was showing is how to make a bridge over a freeway 50, 50 meter, 50 yards or 100 yards without collapsing. And so how you can push those limits, because especially in biology and large uh, area fabrication, you need devices that are suspending you know, more than a few micron or few nanometers. So what is the status of the technology? But we are not reinventing the chemicals. We are using the chemicals in a different way. So this is already established, and some preliminary data has been kind of uh, tuned 
pretty well to, we tune all, everything between 2% up to 49% uh, concentration. Uh, we have shown demonstration on 3N material and uh, free fly material. Uh, so to a certain extent, the, the basic research, research has been done already. Uh, we need a little bit more uh, tunability, of course, because if you go into a product, you have to have a specification for the product, and we are not yet at the level of specification of the product, but we are ready to fabricate something that is quite affordable. So if you go to the next slide, and this is a simple design. It's nothing complicated. No, it doesn't require vacuum. It's adaptable to four, six, eight, 12 inches. They talk about 100 meter, uh, one meter uh, wafer. Well, I don't know that one yet. Uh, but the system is quite controllable. And there are two key points. Uh, first is safer. And all you need for fabricating a system like that, you need a wet bench, a fume hood to test it. And what you need probably between uh, Twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars for the prototype, which includes six months of work, okay, and some material. That's pretty much what you need. What I what I see, and you know, this is probably not part of my business. I'm just in research. But what I see is that a system like that can be easily sold for two thousand dollars with with twenty-five percent markup. I use the twenty-five percent markup because that's what Elon Musk say. I make 25% markup of my car, so I can be competitive against the market. And so, 20, but it's true. So when you invest $60,000 for a prototype, because we already invest $20,000, and you have $500 markup, how many you have to sell? You, I, you can make the market pretty easily, just to recover the basic cost. Everything else is profit. And next slide. And that's it. I think I finished. Hopefully, thank you. Thanks. Can you, can you give us a little bit of structure here so we know how many minutes and the audience also knows kind of what we're doing here? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, so after every speaker, the sharks will have about five minutes to ask questions of the presenters. Um, so, sharks, the floor is yours. Sure. <laughs> First, go, Mark. There we go. All right, um, I guess two, two questions for you, or one comment, one, one question. Um, from someone who uh, does not have a deep technical background, there was a lot of, boy, I feel like I'm not the smartest or the dumbest person in the room here. Um, so I think it would be helpful, at least from my perspective, if in the beginning you, a little bit more of a framing of the problem, what you're trying to solve for here. I think we dove straight into the, the deep technology, which sounds amazing, again, but I'm not in a position to evaluate that, even to put that in context for, for people that don't have that background. And then second of all, but now out of curiosity, questions for what you're developing, as was talked about earlier about deep tech and kind of the second part is the business side of things. So how do you guys think about that? You talk about some margins at the end here, but What's that market look like? What do you think kind of, and where are you kind of w within that starting the company? Would just be helpful to understand kind of the, the, a little bit more on the business side of it. Uh, so, um, um, you, the, the, about the first part, yeah, I got, we got tied in the, in the time and the minute and we don't want to get, but the market, as I announced, the market is semiconductor. So you have, you can have broad, not everything in semiconductor, but you can have a broad vision. What is the market? How the movie sector, uh, phone, computer, uh, satellite, and you know, pretty much everywhere. So MEMS devices, just to give you an example, the gyroscope, gyroscope that is in your cell phone. You know when you turn the cell phone and picture turns, that's what it is. That's a simple application. So uh, what I'm saying is that market is about projected 72 billion. Okay, so even if you can save 1% in a step of the fabrication, those are tens of millions of dollars. Okay, that's what the market means. So then, um, coming to the second, next question, what it takes to build up such a company, as I said, a fume hood, fume hood and a chemical bench. So you, kinda ha you don't really need a clean room, but this is applied to clean room, uh, to clean room area. But you need you know, a, a facility that can handle chemicals. And most of the university, they have it. So this is very simple. It is very affordable for labs and university that they want to do a little bit of scale up, or they want just to have an easy way to uh, remove the material from silicon okay, to enable a specific device. That's the easiest way. So, uh, so to build up a company, of course, it, if you want to build up an area where you have chemical storage or chemical, it will cost more money. It's better that you rent a, a situ an area where already, they already have that one, especially because you don't want to deal with the hazard disposal. 
I've been in, the, in that business, and it's better that you rent someone that knows how to do it, instead of spending mm -hmm. money trying to do it better. The risk is too high. And so, but from that point of view, all you saw here is Teflon okay, and silicon wafer. So the, uh, the material is available. So that they, like, to build up a company, you really need a person working and someone managing it and buying some material. And that's what I think for the prototype. From that point of view, it's all marketing. And uh, so this is you, not me. <laughs> or I can learn it too. But <laughs> did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Um, Drew, New Mexico Angels, thank you. Thank you for being first. It's very difficult with evil still sitting and stuff. So you did a very good job. Um, so you had a great slide very early on that showed the two of you and the wife, which I'm very glad to show the real power in the relationship. So two questions for you. Number one, tell us why you're the superstars and why it's you, the people who should do this. And two, you've got a group of 150 people, the village, that can help raise this child. What is something you want to really make sure everybody here understands to help you make the next couple steps so that we have another other successful business here in New Mexico? So me, I've been in semiconductor industry since 1998. I've been working in semiconductor industry or research since 1998. So I think I've seen a lot. And I, I, I mean, in this process, I understand chemical safety, hazard, environmental safety. So reducing chemicals in the semiconductor industry, uh, it reduces hazard, reduces safety. And I, am, I cannot understand this market. I mean. I understand the technology. Maybe the market not so well, not, not always, like investor, but I understand the technology. So why me? Just because of, because of the knowledge and also became, we came up with an idea that is simple. No, nobody else has came up with that idea, so why not me? Why should be someone else? If she wants to be someone else, I'm very glad that they can manage our idea. Actually, thank you for making a profit and giving me a percentage, like when, and the other, other people will carry out the work. But I pretty count on you, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily me. There should be maybe someone more competent in business. Second thing, I've been involved in a startup business, completely different sector than semiconductor industry in New Mexico and in Arizona, which was Pilot Shop through a friend of mine. Okay, and we, we understood the idea that when you build a business, okay, sorry for being tedious on that, when you build a business, you have two choices. Either you make a profit during the year that you have a business, or you build up the company, the market share, and then you sell it to the best offer. And so that's what we did. We sold the company in 2010, when it was actually the best, the worst time in the market for 10 times the initial investment. So we were happy about that. So this is another point why me. And so what was the last, what should I tell them? What, what do you want to ask the village to help you raise this child? Um, $50,000. <laughs> yeah. That's it. I thought that was 60,000, now it's 50. If we no, wait more, it will become 40. I already put $20,000. <laughs> so, you see. So, uh, of course, I agree. The first one, it's going to be tough, but uh, you know, kudos to you. And uh, we are in a serious business, but levity is always welcomed. Um, having said that, 14.32 uh, billion in 2022 goes to 75 billion in 2032, almost five times in 10 years. But this factors into the consideration. Your time, as such, actually factors in the the, the clean room, the labs, and the facility, and the the resources. Everything is in place. This is more uh, the data will support what is already there. You are trying to bring a disruption into it, which will have its own inherent cost with respect to installation and having all the checks and balances in place. So how did you arrive at that 25% mar markup or margin in terms of like being able to convince those who are saying that if it ain't broken, don't fix it? So we look at uh, it's a good point. And uh, it requires more work. I, I won't be shy and I won't be lied to you. Okay, I, we didn't do an extensive market analysis in precise, also because a lot of documents in the market analysis, you, they ask you to pay $1,000 to add the full documents. So how I arrive, we arrive at the conclusion is that because this technology, I mean, we know the material and the fabrication is not expensive. But you know, once you prototype, you don't need a clear room anymore. The operation is in the clear room, so the user will need a clear room. But your fabrication, it does not require a clear room. But the testing requires a clear room. So once you build your device, device, I call it device because I always talk about device. But once you built the, the system, the, the, uh, this can work in a clear room. Doesn't have to be in a clear room, but you need a chemical bench or a chemical lab. So how many labs there are out there that use uh, uh, you know, hazard chemicals like HF? 
how many labs, how many university. Okay, so if you have the safety environment, you can deploy that in the safety environment. It doesn't require a clearance. Repeat, I don't need a clearance to fabricate it. Okay, but usually these end up to be in a chemical bench or in a clearance because use hazard chemicals. Okay, so, so the, I arrived at that conclusion is looking at the potentiality of the market. All the universities in the United States around the world, all the labs, sometimes also can be in high school uh, if they have uh, proper equipment. So, and the price, the manufacturing price, is very affordable for what I see. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Uh, prove me wrong, no, prove me right, and give me the money. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I hope I answered the question. If I don't, ask me more. You skirted it, but I'll let you go. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for, for Tito and Ravi. And our next presenter, um, let's see, is Akraf Nauradin from UNM. Good day, everyone. Good day. Good day. It's a real delight to be amongst you here today. So when COVID hit, there was a solution. That solution was the vaccine. The vaccine technology was based on nanoparticle that is capable of delivering gene to the body. So in my presentation today, I will be presenting you one specific technology from the ones that I, dis that I disclosed, that is the, the application of this nanoparticles for the treatment of obesity and other metabolic diseases. So one over three adults and one over five kids within the US are obese. This percentage can easily double if we also account for the overweight. Um, so the, and this is also costing the healthcare system over $170 billion. So the problem here is that all those, the obesity is a major cause of other metabolic diseases. I cite, for example, the type 2 diabetes, but also many other types of cancer. I, will, I invite you to look at this representative graph that shows how the percentage or how the evolution of the obesity over, uh, worldwide has exploded within the last 40 years. This means, and for that, I teamed up with a colleague in San Antonio, myself, Ashraf Nuruddin, professor at the UNAM Department of Chemical Engineering, with my colleague, Dr. Maria Gonzalez Porras, at also Biomedical Engineering of the UT San Antonio, to create and disclose a technology that we believe it will have disruptive effect at, at the long term. So this techno so first, what, is the, what are the current therapies for obesity now? We have two, two ways. One, the surgery by what we call the gastric bypass or the liposuction, but also we have six FDA drugs approved for this. The problem is that all those therapies do not uh, may focus on the debulking of the fat mass without any advantageous effect on the um, on the um, what call, the metabolic effect, the metabolic uh, the metabolic activities of the body. Also, those medicines, if if they are stopped, we have a quick gain. Uh, of the, we have quick gain of the weight. They might, might, some of them might be harsh and costly. For example, Saxenda is really, really expensive. It can cost up to $20,000 a year. Those medicine and therapies also cannot be administered to people with major, major metabolic complications such as diabetes and heart diseases. And th that's, that's problematic because more than 80% of diabetic people are overweight or obese. To talk about the innovation, I want you to know that we in the body, in our body, we have two types of fat cells, the white fat cells and the brown fat cells. So we w if we want to compare them, we can simply compare them to the, uh, the, the ant and the grasshopper fable, where the grasshopper is the white fat cell. This is simply uh, the goal of the white fat cell is the insulation and the storage of energy. When we gain weight, we are gaining white fat cells. The brown are stable. The number of the brown fat cells are, is stable. And even if it forms less than 10% of the total mass of the fat in our body, this is considered 
one of the major keys of the metabolism and can be also considered the heat generator of the body. So our innovation is to transform those white fat cells into brown fat cells. So we are transforming energy uh, storage cells into energy expenditure cells to try to play with that balance. How we do that? We disclosed, we created and disclosed the technology of nanoparticles that is capable of delivering genetic therapy to those cells. So this will target specifically the white fat cells and depending on the dose, depending on multiple other factors, it's gonna brown them, try to brown them in order to activate the metabolism in the body while reducing the obesity and other metabolic diseases. The data, those graphs will show you simply that upon administration of our nanoparticle, we have a downregulation of the white fat cell markers, but upregulation, spontaneous upregulation of the brown fat cells markers. And this is correlated with, the, with better control of the mice weight, as you can see on this graph and the photograph. What is the market potential? With the continuously increasing uh, the percentage of obesity worldwide, we have, we, what we know now about the market is that within the USA, the liposuction market is close to $2 billion a year. For the other S6 FDA, uh, uh, 6 FDA approved drugs, the global market today is $1.7 billion, but is expected to be about $13 billion in 2029. So in our case, taking a part of this market would be exciting. <laughs> What is the advantage of this, uh, what, is, what, is the adva what is not the advantage, what is the current status of this technology? So we have developed a prototype, of course it will stay, it will stay under development forever, I would say. And then uh, the technology has been filed, protected. What we are doing now is we are applying, we are optimizing and checking the prototype efficacy in vivo on mice and what we will be, do, uh, what we will be doing very soon is to try these on the human adip uh, adipose tissue. With those, when after the liposuction, we take, those, uh, we, do, we take those fat and we try them in the lab. A future perspective would be to create a startup to find venture studios or to uh, have companies who are already expert in the matter to get interested in our, in our technology. Uh, one thing I also would like to mention is that now what we are doing is that we are injecting it's a subcutaneous injection. At the long term, it will be much more advantageous to have it as a patch that we put that will deliver over time the gene. And this is probably a little bit crazy, but probably if you have uh, watched the movie Passengers and look at those uh, uh, hibernation pods, those hibernation pods are based, or like the people when they hibernate, if they are capable in the future to hibernate, this will be based on that, on that uh, metabolism control. So um, one of the future studies or one of the future um, aspirations would be also to have maybe the NASA or the DOD interested in these technologies. Uh, with that, I'm happy to hear your questions. Thank you for your, your attention. Wow. Uh, do let me know when you're ready. I will just come and see you. Uh, <laughs> Not necessarily for funding, but maybe getting rid of those white cells. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question for you with respect to, I did see that uh, Nigeria, of all places, was there in that map, and I thought that there's a little bit of starvation and everything going on. That's an eye-opener for me. Where did you manage to get that uh, statistics, number one? Because I, I did not locate the source. Uh, and second, you said that tech is filed and protected. What does it mean? Sure. So first about Nigeria, uh, that data is from the World Health Organization. Uh, Nigeria and India, the last two countries, uh, I wanted to show them that even if they are not um, suffering of obesity rates because the obesity rate in, those in, in, in India and Nigeria is less than 10% in total, but the, the evolution of the obesity has increased by 400 and 700%. So it was like 1% in the 70s and now it's 8%, which is alarming if we continue in the, last, in the next years. So it was the World Health Organization. This is the source. In terms of the health, uh, protect, uh, filed and protected, this simply means that we have disclosed our technology to the Rainforest Innovation. And by that, we will be, um, we will be keep adding the data 
in order to be, uh, to be protected. So this is a applic file application, um, a patent application. This is what I meant by protected. Okay, so you have filed it, but you have yes. not been granted even the pro provisional patent. The pro we had the provisional, provisional patent. Yes, you yes, had yes, the provisional yes, yes. Okay, yes. just, just file it. Yes, Thank this is, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you very much for having a story and as a finance person, not a scientist, for having things in a very clear fashion, both uh, pictures and then also with your words. So thank you for that. Um, I'm a proponent of Guy Kawasaki, the art of the start. And what he talks about is having a story. You're not just doing a presentation, but there's an arc of your story. And so there is a next step that I'm wondering about. Um, again, I'm the business person, not the scientist. Tell me what's next for a business development from you and what you uh, see going forward as a business for this. I see this in two ways. First, uh, when, we are talk when we are playing, when we are uh, developing, biomedical technologies is, I think, from bio I think it's, um, it's a separate story so because Having biomedical technologies need money in order for, to do all the clinical trials, need a lot of money to do the clinical trials. So in my case, if I feel that at some point I'm struggling to get those, um, to get uh, people interested in, as investors interested in my case, or to invest this technology, I will be trying to focus more on the science behind this in order to attract big companies for this, for this patent. So I would go with those with those two pathways, either have a company interested in this technology, one of those big companies, or the preferable way is to create a startup, having investors uh, believe in this work. Of course, they won't believe only in me as a person, they will believe in data, so we have to publish that, those data. And when they see that, those data, if they believe in this matter, if they are interested, it could be interested in terms of money, but also on the personal levels, they would be probably inv uh, investing in this technology. So um, let me also commend you. I, th I thought your presentation was great. Thank uh, you. The way that you framed it and articulated it, I think, was, was, was really well done. Um, a little bit of a similar type question. You, you, know, you had that flow chart almost of, of where you are today and where you're going to go. You know, maybe, maybe the venture studio is down the line. Um, you know, for many of us, that's the beginning of the line. So to, to go from where you are today to that point in time, what's going to happen? Are you you know, getting research university funding, you're looking for outside funding, are you developing it with your colleague? Are you gonna bring an outside team? Or how do you think about kind of the business, or you know, what could be a business out of it from now till then? As a scientist, I would think before everything about uh, solidifying the science. So make that technology very solid. So nobody will be able to bypass us yeah. or to, uh, to integrate other things in this technology. For that, for this purpose, now what we are trying to do is we are trying to get fundings for this. So we have two big fundings for the NIH that are uh, studying how the nanoparticles affect those adipocytes or also how these affect the cancer. So it's gonna be the whole, the whole spectrum. After this, again, when we get pub papers published and a solid science behind everything, Absolutely, we are very interested, myself and my colleague, to go for a startup. So uh, again, um, the showcase today was to give you a heads up about what's happening. So probably if I come again to see you in one, two or three years, it's gonna be like internal promise that I will be showing you something more important in, the, in a few years. Okay, I, and you know, would love your contact info. We don't do it, but I have a lot of friends that do seeds, seed investing in your space. And I think, you know, as that develops, we'd love to stay in touch and, and, and help connect the dots there. That'd be great, thank you so much. All right. Grace. Thank you. And our final presenter in this session of presentations is Mara Schindelholz from Sandia National Laboratory. All right, so uh, thank you everyone. My name is Mara Schindelholz, I'm from Sandia. Um, today I'll be talking about a newly developed gas sensor technology nicknamed Endetect, which consists of a platform of tunable nanoporous materials coupled with electrode structures for near zero power detection of gaseous pollutants. We see immediate application of this technology for the detection of nitrogen dioxide, for the defense industry, and in the future for other commercial applications. We have selected the defense industry as our initial market because of our existing expertise in defense and their significant need for low power gas sensors, particularly for the detection of NO2. 
Some Army and Navy munitions, when subject to certain environmental conditions, can begin to degrade, leading to significant reliability and safety concerns. To give you an idea of the scale of this issue, in the 1980s, there were several explosions at munitions facilities that were linked to this known issue. Associated with this degradation is NO2 off-gassing. So while they have made significant design changes, um, they've also had to implement a costly surveillance program, which entails regular chemical analyses to ensure continued safety of their munitions. Similarly, out in the field, these munitions can be subject to certain environmental conditions, such as high heat from a nearby fire or explosion, and immediately afterwards, there's a gap or lack of information on the real-time reliability status of these munitions. By inserting an NO2 sensor nearby uh, these high-value munitions, it would enable them, much like a canary in the coal mine, an early indication of potential reliability and safety concerns, and would allow them to replace their costly surveillance program with real-time monitoring and predictive maintenance, which by a conservative estimate could save them $145 million annually. Existing commercial options that they have tried have failed due to challenges with chemical interference, battery power and power challenges, as well as the complex calibration processes often required with commercial sensors. So that does us, tails us nicely into the specifications associated with gas sensing that are important to potential customers. Specifically for NO2 sensors, the most common commercial applications are within the automotive industry and the monitoring of this toxic, toxic gas to meet environmental specifications. Depending on the application, certain specifications may be of more importance than others. However, four specifications that I have identified that are of importance across a range of customers and industries include sensor power, calibration, chemical interference, and lifetime. And detect meets many of these needs. It's low power, highly gas selective, with an easy and robust calibration process and an enhanced lifetime in comparison to the commercial options. In addition, and detect features a small size and low cost comparable to other existing commercial sensors. So a bit more about our technology. As I mentioned, it's based on a platform of nanoporous materials that are integrated on an interdigitate electrode. These nanoporous materials will intrinsically absorb different gases. So as an example, just as I prefer desserts, and my husband, he's a bit healthier, prefers vegetables, some materials will absorb <laughs> NO2, and others will absorb something like SO2. For our sensor, we are measuring impedance across the electrodes. So with gas absorption, here are our gas molecules now. They'll be absorbed into the nanoporous materials, which will undergo changes in its electronic properties, which we now see as a significant decrease in impedance at low frequencies. We highlighted the benefits of our technology in a recent paper titled Hold On Tight. These nanoporous materials feature increased surface area, pore size, and chemical tunability, which allow you to design a sensor that is highly selective to a particular gas molecule. Similarly, the, these materials' ability to hold on tight to those gas molecules translates well into a type of dosimeter sensor, whereby sensor response is correlated to the quantity of gas absorbed. Lastly, due to the low conductivity of these materials, they are very low power on the order of 15 picowatts. And our measurements are relatively straightforward, meaning these sensors can be readily and easily integrated with modern electronics. Now, comparing some of these benefits to the two main types of commercially available NO2 sensors, metal oxide and electrochemical-based sensors. All existing options and N-Detect feature small size and competitive low cost. Metal oxide sensors feature longer lifetimes, but require more power due to a heating element that is necessary for the measurement. In comparison, electrochemical-based sensors require less power but face challenges with lifetime um, on the order of only a few years. Both types of ch sensors face challenges with chemical interference with ozone and have calibration processes uh, that can be complex and often need to be repeated. End detect is near zero power, and we anticipate lifetimes that are enhanced in comparison to the electrochemical-based sensors. In addition, after over six months in the laboratory, um, we've seen that our data remains steady without any further calibration of our sensor. Lastly, one of the major benefits of this technology is the high selectivity toward an individual gas molecule and our ability to tune that nanoporous material selectivity. Note, for one of the, the materials that we utilize, metal organic frameworks or MOFs, there have been 90,000 synthesized and over 500,000 predicted. Tuning and designing a MOF structure that is specific to an application is a recently emerging and very exciting opportunity uh, to leverage in the design of this sensor. 
So this slide covers our available initial market for our NO2 sensor for our DOD customer. While the stated application is very applicably applicable to munitions and mis missiles globally, just focusing on the U.S., the annual cost of maintaining our conventional munitions and missiles is $3 billion. Now looking at a conservative estimate of what we could expect to impact just the cost of maintaining conventional munitions, that itself is $580 million annually. So commercialization to the DOD is complex and we are very aware of all the challenges. Um, through the Energy i program, we outlined a detailed ecosystem of all the key stakeholders, both within the DOD and commercially, but eventually focused on a sustainable ecosystem, which was to show the flow of intellectual property and hardware from us and detect to its eventual use by those in the Navy and hardware, or in, in the Army. The, the two main pathways that we settled on for our intellectual property and hardware, the flow from us, um, would be to our potential partners, such as military defense contractors or sensor manufacturers. Lastly, in addition to the intellectual property and hardware we could provide uh, in the future for additional revenue, we could provide data analysis and support, as well as additional R&D into different gas applications of interest. So on our technology roadmap, we are transitioning from a tier L5 to a tier L6. We're in the thick of lifetime, reliability, and durability analyses. We have a current partnership with the Kansas City National Security Campus and have our own internal program to develop sensor prototypes uh, that would include embedded electronics and packaging and expect to have our first generation prototype in the next few months. We have continued funding through FY25 with our current DOD and DOE programs, but have begun to seek additional partnerships that could help support the maturation of our manufacturing processes as well as the system integration of our sensor. To that regard, we have had initial conversations with companies that would be potentially interested in licensing our technology, technology and helping to support its maturation through something like a cooperative research agreement or something similar through DOD, um, a program called GEMTIP. To that regard, some of the, the companies that we have uh, had these initial conversations with have existing sensor platforms uh, that we could leverage and integrate with to support further environmental testing as well as low rate production of our sensors. We anticipate by partnering with a company with an existing sensor platform that we could complete these, end these activities and bring Endetect to market um, in a further investment range in the five figure, five figure dollar range versus if we were to go out and start our own startup in the six figure dollar range. Um, so this is our team. We are working diligently uh, to develop and commercialize and detect. We span a range of textual ex expertise uh, from materials science and materials chemistry to sensors to data science. Um, in addition, we've very much benefited from the tremendous resources at Sandia within their business development and tech transfer offices, uh, maintaining strong relationships with individuals in both. In terms of product engineering, we have our current uh, partnership with the Kansas City National Secur Security Campus. Um, and lastly, in terms of the team I wanted to cover, as I mentioned, in the future we foresee that data analysis and support um, could become a greater uh, role in our revenue scheme, and so we are considering potentially adding uh, greater expertise and knowledge in that area as well. So to conclude, the, one of the other major benefits of this technology I wanted to briefly tease is its potential as a platform technology. Because of our ability to tune that nanoporous material selectivity, it's relatively easy for us to pivot to gas detection of a new gas. So for example, this sensor was actually originally developed for iodine detection for the Department of State. Uh, phosphine is a relatively new gas that we're working with this year uh, for our DOD customer. In addition, this year we have research into the ability to apply a filter or to design and develop a single sensor or single sensor response that would be sensitive to multiple gases. So I think all of the legwork that has just been described would build a foundation for us in the future to be able to plug and play new sensors with much lower investment needed uh, for different commercial applications of interest. So something like methane detection from gas well heads or in the same vein of energy production, something like hydrogen detection. So to conclude, um, I hope I've provided insight into an exciting new technology that I think could have wide-ranging impact both within our defense industry uh, market as well as more broadly commercially. We are actively seeking uh, new partners for activities such as licensing or participation in programs such as Trigger, as well as additional demonstration opportunities. We hope that Endetect uh, can become a critical component of a customer's toolkit for the detection of NO2 or other critical gases, reducing their costs and ensuring the safety and reliability of their assets and people. So thank you very much for your time.
So I'll, I'll go first this time since we're rotating. Um, so first, um, compliment uh, the competition slide, the market size, the roadmap slide, some really, really nice slides, very good visuals, again, for the business person. Help me understand, so I appreciate it. Second, a shameless plug. Uh, TJ Cook is in the audience with CNM Ingenuity. If you want another chance to present a Thursday at Startup, their Startup Fiesta is a great chance for everyone here in the room to get another chance to bring a community together. And I really like the fact that at the end there you said what we're looking for. So uh, my question, I guess, to you would be, the chance to expand upon that. This is your village. Yep. You've got a child. You outlined uh, some really great ways to make money and a couple of business strategies. And I thought that was really brilliant. So tell us a little bit more about what's going to help you and help this move forward. Yeah, so so I've kept it kind of ambiguous in terms of going the licensing route or the startup route. Um, I'll just be upfront. I think I'm not sure on the team if we really have the capacity right now to, to go to the startup route. Um, so to to continue to see this technology mature, though, I think that would involve going the licensing route. So I think that's really what we're looking for is potential partners who would be interested in licensing, would be interested in participation in a trigger, not completely closing the door on that startup route in the future. Um, but I think that would be an immediate next step for where we are right now with the technology. That's beautiful. And so one last follow-up I'm going to impose upon my colleagues. So if you were going to do the startup route, there's people here who can start up for you or with you. Right. What would you want in terms of kind of the dating game, so to speak, in terms of building the team or finding people? people to really make a nice New Mexico business? Yeah, um, so I think we would be looking for, I think we have a lot of the technical expertise covered, um, but certainly the business expertise, um, some more knowledge and maybe the commercial markets would be helpful. Um, as I said, I think this technology would pair very nicely with an existing gas sensor or some sort of sensor platform as well. Um, we had had, actually had some discussions with, I mentioned the material, moth materials, but there's a couple of startups around that. Um, they weren't necessarily interested because they're doing uh, more, uh, like gas absorption and desiccant type work. So sensors is kind of a totally different realm for them. So again, someone with the kind of sensor expertise would be very interesting. Thank you. Um, so great job as well. Love the slides. The presentation Thank was you. really well done. I will say one comment. I think, and you talked about it at the end, alluded to, I think for investors, when you talk about a potential for a platform, not just a single product, it gets really interesting for folks. So, okay. you know, great job doing that. It's a nice little, little teaser. Also, it's it's... Continue to, I, I would say, to talk to the extent you talk to investors, continue to focus on so that potential down the road. Yeah. Um, question for you, though, you know, aside from, and this gets to kind of, I, I saw your slide with Honeywell as a, as a competitor, a competitive product, but then also a potential partner. Right. That gets a little bit to Drew's question about kind of where right. you might go with this. I mean, one would, would love to understand a little bit more of that dynamic about like how a Honeywell might look at you. Right. Um, friend or foe or somewhere in between. <laughs> um, but then also for this existing N2 product, you know, what are some other app, are there other applications aside from military today? Right, as you talk about partnering with existing sensor platforms, I'm, I know a lot of them in our world in the travel space that are not focus on the military, but does NO2 have applications? It does. So um, as I mentioned, um, so automotive, I think, is pretty much covered from <laughs> when we've talked to them, and they have their own R&D, and so that sort of thing. Where I think it's interesting is the mo when I mentioned the monitoring of the toxic gases to meet environmental specifications. Um, there's a lot of, actually, we had talked, I don't know if there's anyone from Blue Halo here today, but we had talked to someone from Blue Halo. Um, they have a drone, and so that's of interest for environmental measurements, so having a low power sensor that could be in integrated on, on a drone um, for measuring these uh, toxic gases. So I think um, I think in the toxic gas realm, monitoring, um, there's definitely some, some room for improvement there. So, yeah. yeah. I would I would echo this is this has been a very fantastic presentation <laughs> in terms of uh, the visuals as well as how you kind of presented the pitch. Um, there was uh, one kind of uh, slide that did speak to the roadmap in terms of prototype, 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 and then end customer. Yep. So things are not going to happen magically. You <laughs> need to have a recipe for the business strategy. So I want to a, understand, um, I know you have not kind of firmed up your mind, but to me, most of the nuggets that I did here, it was leading to the startup route. Unfortunately, that's how I ended yes. it. Otherwise, <laughs> how are you gonna empower the customers? That's one. Second thing is, <clears throat> um, in terms of the gases, one of the companies we have had invested that was actually using the breath test and detecting the different types of gases. Um, the challenge that they have had is, in terms of the absorption of the gases, at times they do react with the base. So um, without getting into the nitty-gritties of your technology, we would like to understand what 
could go wrong from your perspective? Do you see potentially there might be challenges with respect to the interference from other gases in the context of the material, the nano um, surface yeah. that it's getting yeah. attached to? So do you foresee that can be one of the challenge? Um, it could be a challenge, but then I think you could also make it to your advantage as well. Um, so you would definitely, I mean, like any of the sensors, you would have to, to investigate th thoroughly the different um, chemical interference and, and what happens, and we're doing that now in terms of water with NO2. Um, but I think um, kind of the exciting part of this technology is um, what I mentioned in terms of being able to apply filters or even having a sensor array that could kind of deal with those chemical interference challenges if you had one that was, you know, sensitive to NO2 and one was kind of preferentially sensitive to SO2. And that's actually where I think you could tie in kind of the data analysis to and kind of big data and AI, um, being able to pick out kind of those chemical interference challenges, which I don't um, know right now in terms of commercially um, how, I mean, I know how they ha handle it, but I don't know if they fully leverage all of kind of like the AI, big data type things that you could do um, to, to combat chemical interference. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. So we will now break for lunch. Um, it looks like they're finishing setting things up, and then we will return at 11.45 for a lunch and panel discussion, companies in New Mexico. Thank you. <laughs>